But go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to be reading a lengthy portion of Scripture, and I just want to welcome everybody who's joining with us online. You're part of what we do, and we love you, and thank you for being with us whenever you're watching. We're in week six. Somebody say week six. We've had a lot. We're in week six of this series entitled In Those Days, as we're pulling on the theme from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, that in those days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And even on your men servants and on your maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days days. And I've come to announce that we're living in those days. Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 14, and then I'm going to skip down to verses 29 through 31. Let's hear the word of the Lord together. And on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. He's saying, let everybody know that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, be quiet. Be quiet. They didn't have anything to say. Be quiet. Somebody just made the person next to you angry. That's not directed toward them. This is just a rhetorical technique called participation. Come on, somebody. Verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. I want to speak to you, David, from this subject. We need more. We need more more. Father, I thank you for your word that it is strong and powerful to deal with the depths of our being. Speak to us from the volume of your word and change us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Acts chapter 4 rests against the backdrop of what the apostles had been doing previously. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were headed to the temple to pray. See, they would go to the temple to pray. They would go to read and and learn and worship. They were going to the temple frequently, even when the people in the temple opposed them. See, this is where a theology, and I'll deal with this in another series, but this is where a theology of the gathered church comes into play. That even when things aren't exactly the way that you want or like, there was still a commitment from the apostles to go to the temple. Even when the people in the temple were radically opposed to them, 
they were headed to the temple to pray. And on their way to the temple, they were headed through the entrance of the gate called Beautiful. And at this gate, there was a lame man who would beg for alms and he would beg for money again and again and again. And he had been crippled for 40 years. And this had been a treacherous experience for him because all the people who would walk by, yes, he was, he was making ends meet through the generosity of God's people, and people were being gracious to him, but just because you solve one problem doesn't mean there isn't another problem. Because even though he had money to take care of himself at this point, he did not have legs to continue taking care of himself. He could not walk. And he had been crippled from birth. And so he would constantly rely on continuous generosity because even if somebody was nice one day, it might not mean he had enough for next month. Sometimes I think that we put bandages on issues and never address the root. And we, we kind of provide some measure of relief for people and provide some me- measure of bandage that, that produces some measure of relief, but the root is never addressed. But Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray. And as they were on the way, the Holy Spirit began to stir their hearts. And this man asked them a question that they probably were asked many times, that this lame man probably asked Jesus many times. But there's a timing to the plans of God. There's a reason why maybe Jesus didn't heal him before because now it was the disciples and the apostles' turn to carry out the ministry of Jesus in the earth. So when they passed by this man, he began to beg and ask for alms. And Peter and John looked at him, and then he told them, look at us. Look at us, he said. Silver and gold we do not have. We don't have a big bank account, the apostles. They said, we don't don't have much money. We don't have a huge 401K. We don't have a lot to spare. We didn't bring any change loose that we can give to you. But what we do have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And for the first time, this cripple from birth began to walk and stood up on his feet and started running through the temple causing chaos because sometimes when God is at work, it can feel uncomfortable to religious people. And people get upset, but it's really God. And so he starts jumping and shouting and praising God. And all the religious leaders say, this guy is ruining our our service. He's messing things up in here. We've got to call together the Sanhedrin and create a tribunal to, to create this jurisdiction and levy our power and show how strong we are and get some order back in this place. And so they called together the court of law and and brought the the ones who they were accusing of doing this nonsense. Who's stirring up these problems? We had everything planned and everything under control, and then these people started messing it up. And so they called Peter and John before the tribunal much as they did Jesus. The time was different. The scenario and situation was different, but the hostility was still real. Because there was real animosity and hatred for Jesus. That's why he was killed. Not just because of the the religious laws that they were frustrated with Jesus about. But they accused him of being a traitor to Caesar. And trying to start a new kingdom in the earth that would overthrow Caesar. So the religious leaders had just, it's just been 50, you know, 60, 70 days since Jesus had, had been killed and, and resurrected. And they still have some wounds on them of frustration and anger. And they're trying to stifle this message out. So they call Peter and John before them. Peter and John enter into this situation where this religious tribunal asks them questions. That's where our text begins today, with the questioning of Peter and John. And it is in that questioning that we're going to look at verses 8 through 12 again, and then we're going to dive into it. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed, somebody say good, Why are you getting mad at good stuff? (laughs) Done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, by this man is he standing before you well. 
This Jesus is the one that you rejected, the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Write this down. The Holy Spirit makes us bold. The Holy Spirit makes us bold. Now, the last time that Peter had faced any kind of resistance to the message of Jesus and being associated with Jesus as at the end of the Gospels before Jesus' crucifixion when he's being wrongly tried for the, his supposed crimes that they're accusing him of, which he didn't commit. And Peter is found around a fire where a young girl asks him, are you one of his and he starts cursing and screaming all kinds of profanities and says, I don't even know the man. I, I don't have any association with him. What a difference that the Holy Spirit makes in our lives. How many of you are grateful that even when we've made mistakes, even when we've failed, that God does not discard us and say that we are disqualified to be used again, but it is in the moments of vulnerability and weakness where he comes, just as he did with Peter at the end of John's gospel, creates a fire and says, Peter, come back over here and ask him for the three times that he denied him, three times if he loved him, and restored him as a foundational apostle in the church of Jesus Christ. It was through that restoration process and the filling of the Holy Spirit that now the once outspoken Peter, who liked to speak his mind, found himself silent in the face of opposition, now filled with the Holy Spirit. He found himself very boisterous, loud, and unafraid of the ramifications of what he said. The Holy Spirit, the text said, filled him and he spoke. You say, well, didn't the Holy Spirit fill him in Acts 2, verse 4? Yes. In the kingdom of God, being filled once does not negate that there are other fillings. See, we've created a mindset where we've created our, our spiritual service like we're a cup. And God's water is poured into that cup of his spirit, and we pour that out and help people. And then and when we're on empty, he comes and refills it, and we pour that out. And then when we're on empty, he refills it, and then we pour it out, and we keep pouring out, but that's not the picture that Scripture paints. In John chapter 7, Jesus said, there's going to be a living water that starts to flow deep inside of you that springs and wells up unto eternal life, and you will be filled and filled and filled again. Did you know that this Greek term denotes that it doesn't mean necessarily that the vessel is empty when it's filled, but that it just means that more is put in the vessel? Because we were never meant to minister until we get empty and then pray to God that he fills us again so that maybe we can help somebody. We're supposed to be so full of the Holy Spirit over and over again that the overflow of his joy, his power, his peace, his anointing is just touching people everywhere we go that like Peter, even our shadow would bring healing to people. That is a paradigm that this passage is creating for us is not one where Peter is like, well, since Acts 2, I've really emptied myself out. I better get real full, real fast, because the Sanhedrin and the tribunal are asking questions, and I got no Jesus inside of me. No, but this is exactly what Jesus told them in Luke's gospel. Acts is the second part to Luke's gospel. Jesus said, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The Holy Spirit makes us bold. He gives us words that are beyond human rationality, beyond our... Have you ever been in a conversation where you're trying to think of like a really good comeback or a debate? I'm not, I'm not talking about like slamming somebody. I just mean like you're in a discussion and you're like, I have a really good counterpoint and I need to flesh this thing out and figure out what I'm going to say. This is what happens. This is called non-active listening. This is how you become a bad friend, a bad spouse. <laughs> when you sit there and only try to formulate your response while somebody's talking, you're not hearing them. So I can imagine that the disciples were in this context like, 
Holy Spirit, I know that, that Jesus said that you were going to give us words, but I wonder how that works. Am I going to like think through and like be pondering the exact words that I'm going to say, and then when they finish, I'm going to just say it, and it's going to drop them to their knees, and they're going to say, I'm sorry. How does this thing work? Notice that they brought Peter and John and this crippled man now healed in to try them and to bring accusation against them and immediately put them on the defense. I don't know if you've noticed, but everything in our society is attempting to put believers on the defense. Every iota, it seems, is a measure in which society's whims and turns and flow is running exactly opposite and antagonistic toward the kingdom of God, the truth of God's word, and, and, and instantly puts people on the defensive who are believers. But look at what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives them boldness and says, no, 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 we're not going on defense, we're going on offense. We're not going to sit here and keep playing defense over and over and over again and never move anything forward. We're going on the offensive. So Peter said, let it be known to you and to all you listening, that that it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you killed. You killed the prince of life, but God raised him from the dead, and that's how this man was made whole. Jesus did it. So now he puts the religious tribunal on the defensive. They're like, oh no, we thought we ended this Jesus stuff, and now it's creeping back into our temple, and now there's actual miracles happening, and things are happening at the name of Jesus that don't happen when we recite our Pharisaical and Sadducean prayers. It's not happening, but when they talk about Jesus, stuff starts happening. There is a validation to the message that brings great boldness for them. Now, now religious folk And religious leaders in this context did not like that one bit because when they began to turn the conversation to the offensive, okay, this doesn't mean the disciples were mean, okay? I don't have this picture in my mind when he's saying this and he's like screaming to the top of his lungs and yelling at them. I think he's declaring, announcing. The text is saying that he's proclaiming this, like he's announcing this. You killed him, but God vindicated him by raising him from the dead, and, and while he is doing this, it immediately strikes the religious leaders because they move into a position now where their status quo is threatened. The Holy Spirit loves threatening normal. The Holy Spirit will take everything that you think about God. I'm not talking about in a way that's contrary to the Word of God, but I'm saying he will take things that you think you know about God and he will turn them on their head and reveal to you, maybe it's not quite like what I thought. Maybe there's something different. The religious leaders hated this because now they're saying Jesus is the high priest. So Annas and Caiaphas and all that, that's a direct assault on their authority. So now they can't sit there and wave their authority at people because they're saying Jesus is the high priest, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God's son, and he's the one that we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to men or are we going to listen to God? And so the religious leaders are losing the grip of their systems and their power and their structure, and the Holy Spirit loves doing that. I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things that God was trying to get the church to understand is to lose that grip of what they thought they knew about what the gathering was supposed to be like. Now, sometimes we don't pick up on those things and learn from them, but one of the things he was trying to do was emphasize some shifts that he wanted in the, in the body of Christ and emphasize some changes that he was wanting to get us aligned with the spirit and the bride saying, come Lord Jesus. So the religious leaders became threatened when the Holy Spirit took Peter and John and put them directly on the offensive and made them bold. They said this, they said, it's by Jesus that this man has been made whole or healed. The Greek term is sozo, and it has a couple of nuances within. It both deals with spiritual salvation or you being saved spiritually, but sozo also has a therapeutic understanding, meaning that it also deals with physical healing because God is not just concerned about your soul. 
He cares about your body and you as a whole person. That's why shalom and these Hebrew understandings of God's peace and salvation deal with the whole entire being, the whole person, not just the soul of a person. That's one thing, this bad one we've kind of divvied up through Western thinking about, okay, we have body, mind, and spirit, and the spirit's all that matters. And who cares about my body and all this? The body is going to be resurrected, and that's what you're going to have in heaven. It's just going to be looking a little bit different. Okay, there's a resurrection of the body, and Jesus cares about our bodies. His salvation, his death, his burial and resurrection not just deals with with spiritual and mental parameters, but he even brings salvation and healing to our bodies because he cares about us as a whole person. And so look at what Peter and John do. They do not just say, well, because of Jesus, this man has been sozoed. He's been therapeutically healed by God in his body. But they also say that he's been healed and saved in his heart too. Because what happens is when we get in conversations with people, we'll often try to hide things about God. So we'll say one thing that sounds okay that we think somebody will like, and then we're like, we'll save this one for later because this one might really bite us on the tail. We might get ourselves into trouble. They might think we're strange or weird or something going on. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness to to share the, the whole truth, the entire truth. That it's by the name of Jesus and Jesus Christ of Nazareth alone that we can be changed, body, soul, and spirit. It's by his name alone that anything valuable and eternal can take place. The Holy Spirit makes us bold. How many of you would say, I want the Holy Spirit's boldness in my life? I know that I do. I don't want to be teetering and tottering on people. Like, oh my goodness, I'm so scared to talk about Jesus. What will somebody think? What will somebody? He's my life. He's my world. He's everything to me. So if you get to know me, you're going to get to know him. Okay, there's a way that we go about sharing him that is Uh, winsome to people. There's a way that we go about sharing our relationship with him that is led by the Spirit and winsome. But but church, the, the time has come, the hour is now where we have Holy Spirit boldness within our hearts to share the whole truth about Jesus. Not just one part, not just one section, but the whole truth. Somebody say, the Holy Spirit makes us bold. Yes. Now verses 13 and 14 reveal something else else and illuminate this reality. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Write this down. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus. Notice that the knee-jerk reaction of the religious leaders was this. You don't have training. Who are you to talk to us? You don't know anything that we know. You haven't been to school like we have. What do you know about God? Who do you think you are? That's their knee-jerk reaction when, when Peter and John began to address them because they knew that Peter and John had not undergone formal rabbinical training. Peter and John didn't go to rabbi school like, like these religious leaders went to ra- rabbinical school. They, they, they did not have the same measure of formal training, but, but something caught the eye of these religious leaders. They noticed something. They said, we've seen this before. Where is it that we've seen this before? We've heard people talk like this before. We've heard someone act like this before. We've seen somebody do these kinds of things before. And in their mind, while Peter and John, although they have not been to formal rabbinical training, they say they know the scriptures. They're talking about experiences. They're seeing signs and wonders. Who else was like that that we've met before? And immediately they go to Jesus. They say, we know that Jesus isn't walking around here in the temple anymore, but, but I, I, I'm telling you, if I closed my eyes, I would think it was him. If we, if we closed our eyes and, and listened to this series of events and heard your argumentation and heard your defense and offense of the gospel of Jesus and saw the signs and the wonders that accompanied him, I would promise you that it was him in the earth. The religious leaders recognized 
that they had been with Jesus. But what was it that caused them to recognize that they had been with Jesus? I believe it was their love and knowledge of the word of God. I believe that even though they had not been formally trained, they saw Peter and John and the way that they maneuvered and utilized the scriptures and wove them in from Old to New Testament realities, connected them together, and then had demonstrable proof right there. They had the best preaching illustration ever. A man who everybody knew couldn't walk is all of a sudden jumping. And they said, you know, they're, they're mastering the scriptures here. They're weaving them together. He's quoting Psalm 118 at me. You are the ones who rejected the chief cornerstone, but now God has vindicated him by the resurrection. See, they thought because they killed him that he was indeed a liar. But the psalmist said, you will not let your righteous seed see corruption. You will not keep them there, but you will raise him up. And God vindicated and validated the ministry, life, teaching, and message of Jesus when and God raised Jesus from the dead. He said, everything that he did was true, and it has my stamp of approval. I will raise him from the dead and validate everything he's done. And it was in their mastery of the word of God that they said, this seems like Jesus, who I remember him at 12 years old in the temple having conversations with us, and they stood amazed at the knowledge and wisdom that Jesus had of the scriptures even as a boy. They stood in awe and wonder of his knowledge. They said, I remember when he would ask us about the resurrection from the dead, and he would ask us by what is, is who did John the Baptist come from, or, or by what ministry did he have? And I remember when he asked, when we tried to stump him and, and say, how, how are you going to pay taxes? And what do you give this to? And he said, whose image is on it? And he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God. I remember when he told a parable about a vineyard and he said that I'd sent prophets and I'd sent people all throughout human history to reach you and you hurt them and harm them and kill them. And, and all this was cycling back through their mind. And they said, we've seen some somebody like this before. And although Peter and John did not go to formal rabbinical training, they had the greatest rabbi in human history, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who they lived and breathed and, and learned from for three years under his tutelage and under his training. And he taught them that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Just as he learned in the desert when the Holy Spirit sent him out for 40 days into the wilderness and the devil came came to him and said, turn these stones to bread. And he took Deuteronomy, and three times he used Deuteronomy to push back the temptations of the devil. The religious leaders said, my goodness, if we didn't know any better, then we'd think this is Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus, and one of the primary ways that he does that is he makes us love the Word of God. In the beginning, John 1.1 1, 1 was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with, it was God. He, Jesus, is the eternal Word of God. Every word from this book comes from the mouth of God, inspired through different epochs of human history with different human writers, all breathed upon by the Holy Spirit. For the Word of God is profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting so that the person of God can be fully equipped and the Holy Spirit makes us love the Word of God. And then when we love and feast upon the Word of God, we start to become more and more and more like Jesus. So that when people see us, the Word of God is just pouring forth from us. It's leaking everywhere into the world. It's going everywhere. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word guides every decision. His word trumps every single bad report that is received. His word brings peace when our world is in chaos. His word brings provision when our world is in lack. He sent his word and healed them of their diseases. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus by loving the Word of God. But he doesn't just stop there. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus by seeing signs and wonders validate the Word that is declared. The Apostle Paul said it like this to the church at Corinth. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk but of power. 
He told the church at Rome, I've went around the whole known world and I've preached the gospel and it's been validated by signs and wonders. In the gospel of Mark, he says this, he says, go out and heal the sick and cast out demons freely you have received, now freely give it away. The, the kingdom of God, the message of the gospel is not just a theoretical, philosophical, or theological one. It's a practical one. It really changes your life. It really shapes who you are. It really transforms you. And it really has a bearing on life. It really changes your experience of life. It really brings freedom to those who are bound and health and wholeness to those who are sick. For Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives. He has sent me to bind up the wounds of those who are broken. He has sent me to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The Spirit of God comes upon us and gives us gifts so that the work and ministry of Jesus continues in the earth. That is why in John 14, Jesus told the disciples, he said, you don't need to be discouraged. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, then I cannot send the helper. But if I go away, I will send the helper, and he will come and cling to your side, and you will actually do even greater things than I have done. I can imagine that Peter and John have these words rattling around their head when they call out to this man at the gate beautiful and say look at us we don't have silver and gold but what we do have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth get up and walk the Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus through the works that he does through us as we partner with him it's not by might it's not by power it's by my spirit says the Lord I believe that that's one of the reasons Zechariah had prophesied that because as humans, we try to make it about what we do. We try to make it about how hard we've prayed or how hard we've worked for this or how much we've believed for this to happen. But it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth who is the only one who brings healing. His healing does not come through a person. It comes from him. We just partner with his activity and say yes to what he is doing and stand in faithful agreement with what he's already done. The Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus. So that when people look at us, they say, I know I haven't met you. Nobody in this room has had an experience where Jesus has been walking in the earth and they followed him for three years and been taught by him physically in person, in the body. He's been traveling. Y'all been in the same house. Nobody in this room has had that same experience that the original apostles have because Jesus has ascended and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. So nobody in the world today has walked with the man Christ Jesus physically for three and a half years and been taught by him personally. And yet I'm afraid that the church is not getting the download from the Holy Spirit to look like Jesus in the earth. So people are not seeing who he really is because they're not really seeing Christ in us, the hope of glory. But the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to make so many little Christs, little the Christians, I'm going to make so many mini-me's in the earth that look just like my son Jesus as children of God. I'm going to make so many that everywhere they go, the world is surrounded by me. Everywhere they go, they're running into my love. Everywhere they go, they're running into my healing. Everywhere they go, they're running into my touch. Most of Jesus' miracles were not in the temple. He's sending us out, and the Holy Spirit makes us look like Jesus. Did you know that one of the greatest compliments I ever received, Tiffany and I were at Outback because we were in great need of some cheddar and bacon fries. Somebody had blessed us with a gift card. And so you just have to do that because it's great for your heart and your diet, and it's amazing. It's, it really, truly is. So we're eating bacon, cheddar, cheese fries, just having a blast. And the waiter comes up 
And we're just sitting there, and we're having a good conversation. And he said, what is it? What, what is that? What's going on with you? You're different. Something's going on. I don't know what it is, but it's good. So I just feel like this good vibes coming from you. I just feel like this presence coming from you. It's kind of like it's bright and it's good. And I don't, I've not really felt that kind of thing before. What is that? I said, that comes from being with Jesus. He said, oh, well, I, I, need, I want to go to church. I, I need to go to church then. I need to, I need to get, I need that. Whatever that, that thing is around you, I want that thing on my life. I love it when people who haven't been in church and don't know God, they don't know all the religious language. They don't know all the terms. They just know, hey, something's weird or different, and I kind of like it, and it's cool. What is that thing? <laughs> it's one of the greatest experiences you ever have because the Holy Spirit will do the work in opening the doors by making us look like Jesus. I'm not saying I've walked around that always happens. Come on. That was just a great opportunity where the Holy Spirit just in that moment, for the sake of that waiter, said, I've got to find a vessel I can make look like Jesus right now so that I can reach this person and touch their heart where they're at. I've got a message for them. And we had conversation, and and, and it was amazing and wonderful. But that's one of the greatest experiences. Evangelism becomes so easy. Sharing faith becomes so easy when everybody starts asking you about it. It becomes so natural. It becomes conversational. It doesn't become what I call the stick em up approach. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? Yes. <laughs> That's normally not a great way to start a conversation unless, you know, there are some occasions where the Holy Spirit will just tell you to do something very urgent, and I understand that. But I'm saying as a As a general rule, the Holy Spirit loves making us look like Jesus and people just coming around us and saying, what is going on with that? I want that. I don't know what that is, but I want that. You've got hardships in your life, but I want that. We're celebrating Father's Day today, and this is my first Father's Day as a father. We have our beautiful baby girl, because life begins at conception, so I don't have to wait till a baby's born to be a father. I thought I'd get shouted at more than that, but I'll I'll try that again later in the sermon. One of the the greatest experiences that was also one of the most traumatic times was when we lost our first baby. And we had been trying for two years, and we had been holding on to a promise from God from, from about a year and a half prior to that, and we thought that our first baby was the answer to that promise but we prayed and contended and we lost our baby but that does not mean that God is a liar that does not mean that God is not healer that does not mean that God is not love that does not mean that God abandoned us it just means that there was another plan in place it just was a not yet not a no just a not yet And in that season, there was so much agony and so much emotional turmoil and so much pain. And I pray, I shared this a couple months ago. I prayed in the parking lot. One of my Apple devices started acting crazy. Apple sends me duds on purpose just to get me back in their store to buy something else. I'm convinced of it because they know I will. So so I'm, I'm going into the store. It's been three days since we lost our baby. And I'm going into the store, and I just said, Holy Spirit, I said, I'm, I'm so weak right now, emotionally, I'm so, I'm so weak, I'm so torn, I'm, I'm shattered, my heart is broken right now, I just buried our baby, I said, my heart is crushed, I said, but you are good, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is with me, I said, will you just help me look like Jesus in this ridiculous Apple store that I'm so mad that my Apple, now my Apple stuff is breaking. I'm like, ah, I'm just so mad and frustrated. I said, but help me look like Jesus. And I went down and I I sat at the table and the lady brings out the diagnostic tools to figure out what's happening with my device. And she said, what's this aura thing around you? What's going on? What is that? Feels really good. I don't know what it is, but I like it. And I said, 
you know, I prayed before I came here that God would show his love to somebody in here. And I said, it's you. I said, God wants you to know how much he loves you. It doesn't matter how weak we are and how feeble we are and how broken we are. We are but earthen vessels. And the Holy Spirit shows the love of God through us and makes us look like Jesus in the earth. When Lazarus, Jesus' best friend, has died, Jesus wept bitterly and cried for a period of time. But he didn't treat other people poorly. When he was being tormented, knowing that he was asking the Father to take away the cup of suffering, he didn't treat people terribly. The love of God was still flowing through the Son, Jesus. And in the same way, no matter what we're dealing with, the Holy Spirit can make us look like Jesus. It doesn't matter if you've served him for 30 years or you just start serving him today. The Holy Spirit can make you look like Jesus. Let me tell you another thing. I'm going to land here. Verses 29 through 31. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. I'm jumping down here. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, when the church prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Write this down. The Holy Spirit gives us more because we need, we need more. Notice that in the face of persecution, the apostles did not say, Lord, take this suffering away. Take this away. Get these, go, go kill these bad religious leaders. Get them out of the, get them out of my life. Punish them. Strike them down with lightning. Get them out. <laughs> the apostles did not say, we don't like being opposed, and we need you to remove all the opposition from our life. Notice what the apostles said. Holy Spirit, give us boldness to declare your word with all power and authority from heaven. The Holy Spirit wants to give us more boldness than we've ever had before to reveal and declare the truth of God's word in spite of anything we face. Jesus promised us that in this world we would have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In spite of the things that we face, the Holy Spirit wants to give us more boldness. He did not say, I'm just going to remove every sense of resistance or opposition and just plow it over. He said, but what I will do, now sometimes God does that and that's amazing, but what he said I will do, I'll always give you more and more boldness to walk into any situation, any room, any atmosphere, any environment, and declare my word with boldness unashamed and unafraid because the Holy Spirit makes us bold. He gives us more. Hallelujah. I'm glad that he gives us more. Now, their concern was not self-preservation. We're going to hide out. We're in danger. We're getting out of this play. We're going to hide out. Their concern was not what's in it for me. Their concern was how does this message go out? How does this message go out and affect change in the earth? How do we make a difference? That was their focus. That was their desire. How does this word go out? So they said, will you, in prayer, they said, will you, God, stretch out your hand? There are a lot of people who are trying to stretch out their own hand. Paul said to the Galatians, O oh, foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, do you now so quickly revert to the flesh? There are a lot of things being done in the name of Christ that do not require Christ. There are a lot of things being done, a lot of events being held that do not require the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to maintain themselves. Because having begun with the right intentions and good efforts, it's easy as humans to begin to put it on our plate and say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make this happen, and I'm going to fix this situation, and we're going to create this experience, and we're going to make this thing awesome, and we're going to have this thing figured out. And, and the apostle said, no, 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 no. Even though we've had success, even though 5,000 people were added, even though we're seeing people healed, it's all about you. Will you stretch out your hand? 
The outstretched hand of God was thematic throughout the Old Testament. At the parting of the Red Sea and the freeing of the Hebrew people from Egyptian bondage and slavery, it was the outstretched hand of God that brought freedom to them. So the outstretched arm of God to these people, these apostles represented freedom and power. To the opposing wicked kings, Isaiah prophesied that the outstretched hand of the Lord would bring deliverance and punishment to these wicked and godless kings. The outstretched hand of God theologically for these apostles meant all oh, where his hand is, his blessing is. Where his hand is, the activities there. Jesus said, if, the thing, if I cast out demons in, in, in my name and by this authority from God, then the thing finger of God is upon you. The hand of God is representative of the power and the authority and the plans and purposes of God. So they say, God, put your hand over this region. That is one of the best prayers you'll ever pray. The Lord birthed this desire in me in 2015. This is one of my favorite passages and the first time I'm preaching it. In 2015 in Singapore, I heard a couple who were part of an uh, English and Irish revival in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they said this drove their ministry. Lord, stretch out your hand. We only want to be where your hand is at. We only want to function where your hand is functioning. We don't want to get outside of the covering of your hand. We don't want to start trying to do it with our hands alone. We want to rely on your hand stretched out over us. I told our leaders in our VIP meeting this morning, that Randy Clark, who was a seminal figure in the Toronto blessing of the late mid-90s in Canada, a, a revival movement that changed the world, literally. Randy Clark was one of the first ones, and he has a ministry school in Pennsylvania now. And, and one of the things that he teaches and does frequently is say, where is the hand of God in a service? Who is he touching? Where is it at? Because that's, that's where I want to partner that's when I want to come alongside and say yes and amen to that. Because you know it, by discernment, by the Spirit, where the hand of God is, who He's touching, who He's challenging, who he's, he's resting upon. And we just want to come and partner with what He's doing. That's what the Holy Spirit makes us realize. We need more of His hand and less of us. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and then you'll be exalted in due time. We need to get up under the hand of God with humility and realize that it's only His hand that accomplishes anything. We need more of His hand and less of the hand of humans trying to make things happen. We need the hand of God over at Oklahoma City. Father, we just know that only by Your hand over this region can anything lasting take place. We need to be contending as a church. Now, I, don't, I don't know. There may be other churches praying this. There may not. I don't know. But we will pray for the hand of God to be over this city. We will be intercessors like Abraham was over Sodom and Gomorrah and say, Oh, God, if there are just ten righteous, let your hand be over this city. Touch lives. Heal people so that signs and wonders would be done because we're not just Old Testament people who have an outstretched hand over us. We're New Testament people who have a name given greater than any other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of the Father that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So we not only have a hand, but we have a name. We need to start employing the name of Jesus over our families and over our church and over this city and over our nation. We need that powerful name. It's not a name like you would cast some kind of incantation or spell and just wave a name around. It's a name that God gave, meaning Jesus, it means he saves. He stretches out his hand and redeems. He's been given that name. God has given us the authority as his children to utilize that name all authority has been given to the Son, Jesus, in that name. Therefore, go into the, all the earth and make disciples, teaching them to obey all of command and baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. He's given us a hand and a name. But look what he does to validate this because the Holy Spirit wants to give us more and we need it. Look at this. God loved the prayer. And the way that God validated the prayer is by doing this. 
He said, I'm going to fill you again. But wait a minute, I thought Peter was filled in Acts 2.4 and Acts 4.8. And now it's Acts 4.31 and he's getting filled again. Why? Because we need more. We got people who've had an experience 30 years ago in an altar and say, I'm good. We need more. There's more in God. There's always more. He is infinite. There's always more, and we need more. So he said, I'm going to fill you. We need more filling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. But he said, I'm not just going to fill you. He said, I am going to shake this building as a sign that my power will come upon you. My boldness will come upon you. I will fill your mouth with the words to say, I will partner my hand with your hand. And when you stretch out your hand, it's as though I'm stretching out my hand, and I'm going to touch people through your ministry. So he shook the building. He had come to them in Acts chapter 2 like fire as flaming tongues like a fire came and sat on them. He came to them in Acts chapter 2 like wind and there was a mighty violent gust of wind that blew through the house and now in Acts 4 he has come to them like an earthquake and he starts to shake the foundations of their gathering. I want the earthquake of God. I want his shaking in our lives and in our church. He came and shook the building as a validation that I'll give you more. See, we limit God and say, okay, if I feel a little tingly something, that's about all I can handle. That's good. That's about the maximum experience I can have. And he's ready to send uh, 9.8 on the Richter scale earthquakes in our church. And we're like, "Ah, I felt a little goosebump. I'm good. Right? He wants to give us more, but we have closed off our mind to the capabilities of God of what he wants to do. And we have limited him to what we think he wants to do. And he says, I want to give you more. I want to give you more. This is what else he does. He said, I want to give you more boldness. He said, I'm going to answer your prayer by even making you bolder than you were the first time that you proclaimed to the religious leaders. How else would would Peter and John go back and get beaten half to death, whipped with the scourge, with a cat of nine, to, with a whip? How else would somebody get beaten half to death and then say they left rejoicing, considering it a privilege to suffer for the name? That's a level of boldness. H- how else could you that church history teaches, say, I don't want to be crucified in the same way as my Lord, but turn me upside down, Peter said, and crucify me that way because I'm not counted worthy to suffer in the same way. That's bold. How about Thomas in Ethiopia? Church history records that he gets a pit dug out for him. The the indigenous Ethiopians throw him in a pit and then surround him with spears and plunge them into him. How about that for boldness? Guess who wasn't doubting then? Oh, doubting Thomas, you know, we talk, guess who was standing with great boldness and great authority and great conviction that you, you, you don't see me right now in the flesh. He said, blessed are those who do not see me and believe. But he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I can imagine these words running through Thomas' head. I'm going to prepare, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. This was a different Thomas than the one saying, if I don't touch his pierced side and I don't touch his pierced hands, I'll never believe. He's in the pit surrounded by spears saying, Jesus is the Lord and I will never recant. That's what more looks like. The Holy Spirit wants to give us more boldness. Let's stand to our feet, church. We need more. We need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need more to make us bold. We need more to make us look like Jesus in our spheres of influence. We need more so that we can continue to hunger and thirst for the presence of God. Prayer team, if you would at this time, if you'll just come forward, I just want to create some space for people who say, I I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I I want that measure of boldness. I want that measure of love. I want that measure of comfort. I want that measure of presence issuing forth from my life. And and as I pray over us corporately, I just want to invite you, if you say, I want a little bit specific prayer from one of our prayer team leaders, I just want you to come up while I'm praying 
over us as a church and just come up and receive more. And if you don't come up, you still need more of the Holy Spirit. So just ask the Holy Spirit right where you are or up here for some personal prayer time for more. So let's just, if you would, just open your hands in front of you. Let's just get in a posture of receiving from the Lord here for a moment. If you want more, just just go ahead and come and start receiving prayer. I'm going to begin to pray over us. Father, we thank you for your word, that it's sharp, that it pierces, that it touches, that it changes, that it that it moves upon us, that it challenges us, that it shapes us, and that it causes us to cry out for more. Holy Spirit, we're just asking today that you would shake us to our core, that you would, just as you did with the early apostles and apostolic leaders, as you came and you filled them again and again and again, that you would come, Holy Spirit, and fill us today. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your boldness. Fill us with courage that would change us so that when people would look upon us, they would say, surely you have been with Jesus. Surely you have encountered him. Surely you have walked with him because there is something inexplainable about your life that we can't put our finger on, but we know it's something amazing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would come and touch every heart here today with the more of God, that you would come and pour out your oil, you would come and pour out your fire, you would come and pour out your spirit. For in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So we pray from the youngest to the oldest that every person here would receive a fresh touch from God, that there would be a fresh tenderizing in the heart, that there would be a healing in the heart, that there would be a hunger in the heart, that you would stir up a desire for more. Lord, that we would be full and yet not satisfied with the place where we're at. We would be grateful and thankful and yet craving more of your presence. Lord, fill us with more. Come on, just in your own words right now, just just open up your hands to God and just say, I need more. I, I, God, will you give me more? I, I need more of you in my life. I need more. He, he loves the hunger. He loves the humility. He loves the desire. Just ask him. We serve a good father who will not give those his children uh, who ask for bread a stone. He, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we say, Father, pour out your spirit upon us. Shake us to our core. Change our lives. Anoint our hands. Uh, change our speech. Change our life. Make us more like Jesus. So right now in this atmosphere, as people are praying, I just want to send you out today with a blessing. And if you want to continue to receive more prayers, stay in the atmosphere. We'll keep it a little bit longer. But but if you will, just open out your hands in front of you. And I want to send you out with a prayer of blessing. So church today, I, I bless you in the name of God the Father. I bless you in the name of God the Son. And I bless you in the name of God, the Holy Spirit, that all the days of your life, from this point forward, you would walk in the hunger and desire for the more of God, that you would crave His presence, you would crave His Word, you would crave to look more like Him, be more like Him, speak more like Him, act more like Him wherever you are, not just at church, not just with family, not just with friends, but even by yourself that you would say make me more like Jesus so today I I pray the blessing of Paul over you now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.